National Center for Scholars, King's College London, and the London School of Economics. Before becoming an academic, he worked for the United Nations, and his lecture will be on the invention, the invention of regions. They are yours. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the invite. It's a real treat and pleasure to be here. It's my first time. Um, I got two versions of the program. Pedro sent me, Andres sent me the original version several weeks ago, and then Pedro sent me an update of that paper. And there were different wordings in those two papers. The first paper asked me to talk about the construction of a region. And construction, of course, alludes to the mechanics of region building. So I will do a little bit of that. But the second version, didn't say the construction of a region, it said the invention of a region. And invention alludes to something very different, not to do with the mechanics of region building, but with the normative ideational side of the story. So what I thought I'd do is play with both. Uh, I will organize my presentation in four bits. I'm going to give you the four frameworks that I like to use whenever trying to think through a region, and the region I pay most attention to is South America, professionally. But these are frameworks that could be well used to look at any other region, uh, maybe Europe, of course, but also Asia. The most creative person working in this field now is, of course, Anita Vicharia, whom you had on day one, I think, according to the program. Um, so I will certainly not repeat him, I will give you a different twist. Um, but these are the frameworks that I, have, that I have in mind. So the first one is to do with power and power balances, and what can we get from power and power balance analysis when making sense of a region. The second one will be on institutions and institution building. Very traditional IR kind of stuff. The third one will be on global governance regional governance, what are the elements of governance that one needs to pay attention to when going through the motions of the region. And then lastly, I want to talk about normative theory and what normative theory tells us about the construction of regions and the invention of regions. And actually, I think it was a lovely thing to have the two things in the two versions of the paper because those two versions actually go to the heart of the matter. If you want to understand the region and what the hell is going on in a given region, and Europe today is a wonderful place to ask the big what the hell question. You want to do bits of construction of the region and bits of the invention of the region. So let me start with power and, and power balances. This pushes us all the way back to IR 101, and the best reference here, I think, is Bill Walford um, on his PhD thesis. And the first question one wants to ask oneself about power and power balance in the region is, what is the power dynamic that dominates in a given region? And there are two. Is it balancing, balance of power, or is it bandwagoning? It's it sounds very simplistic, but it actually isn't because different states in the same region will have different theories in their elite's heads as to how power operates within a given region. Let me illustrate this with reference to South America. For over a hundred years in South America, the major country in the region and the second major country in the region, both held the view that balance of power was the dominant dynamic. And balance of power theory says that in a given region, the biggest country in town is always afraid and reluctant to conduct too an assertive foreign policy with the fear that the second ranking powers will get together in an anti-hegemonic coalition. So balance of power theory suggests that the major country in a given region will be afraid, will be reluctant to engage its own region, because doing too much will prompt a counter-hegemonic coalition. 
led by country number two and the smaller ones around it. And this is precisely the theory Brazilian elites developed at the end, time of the empire in the 1850s under this guy called the Viscount of Rio Branco. For those who know Brazil, this is the father of the Baron of Rio Branco, which is a founder of the Republic. So the Viscount of Rio Branco in 1850 begins to produce a plethora of texts as he travels around South America saying, we don't want to have too much of an active regional policy because if we do, we're so big that we are going to push Argentina to lead a counter anti-Brazilian coalition alongside the other Hispanic American states. We're very different from this region anyway because we don't speak Spanish, we speak Portuguese, because we're not republics, we're a monarchy. So the focus of our foreign policy should be Europe and then the United States always as leverage against the possibility of Argentina running a counter-hegemonic coalition. Argentina at the time had the same theory in mind. And Argentina behaved very much as the organizer of the anti-Brazil coalition in all matters of regional law and norms and security. And this theory held true all the way up to 1974. In 1974, for the first time, a Brazilian administration begins to develop the argument that actually, power dynamics have just changed. And the reason they have changed is not because the nature of power has changed, it's because the nature of Argentina's power has changed. Because Argentina is declining so fast, economically, politically, and diplomatically, no longer can Argentina conduct an anti-Brazil coalition in South America. And if you have no one to organize that, then the nature of the framework changes, and you no longer have balance of power as the dominant mechanism of power in the region. What you have is unwavering. Because there is no one to organize the anti-hegemonic coalition, the hegemon can actually carry the debt, can do lots of stuff in the region, and smaller neighbors will follow. The ability to resist begins to go down. The first time a piece of paper in Brazil's diplomacy comes up with the notion that Argentina can no longer conduct the anti-hegemonic policies of yore is 1974. And over time, from 84 to 84, from 74 to 84, in a period of 10 years, that only is reinforced from the standpoint of Brazil. And the zenith of all this is when Argentina goes to war, conventional war against a NATO power over the Malvinas Falkland Islands. And then the Brazilians say, aha, it is so clear there is no ability on the part of Argentina to conduct anything. So from now on, our regional policy ought to change. And when you look at how that policy evolved, it's really quite astounding. Up until 1982, no Brazilian head of state had ever set foot in Peru, Colombia, or Venezuela. 1982. Talk about the invention of a region. This is only 30 years ago. Huge transformation. And this transformation is at heart a transformation in the way Brazilian leaders have understood the mechanics of power and power balance. The system in South America shifted from balance of power to bandwagoning. So you begin to have a push from the part of Brazil to invest in regional countries in ways that no one could have dreamt of before. Gas pipelines with Bolivia, big electricity dams alongside with Paraguay, huge trade push with Argentina itself, now a very weakened Argentina. And then that can have an awful lot of impact on the institutional side of the story, and I will talk about that in a minute. 
So the first thing I do when I look at a region is try to understand how the major players understand balance of power. Do they believe the dominant logic is balancing or do they believe it's even wagoning? And you can do beautiful things applying that to Germany today as you can do beautiful things applying that to China or to Iran or to the United States. Uh, so that's number one. The second thing is to do with hierarchy. And I understand you had a lecture with Andy Harold the other day. And when looking at hierarchy and hierarchies of power, the first thing you want to look at is, of course, resistance. So if you want to understand the construction of a region, the question you want to ask yourself is how has resistance evolved, resistance to power evolved in the region? And for the case of Latin America, of course, we have waves of resistance to. Spanish and Portuguese dominion, then resistance to British dominance, then resistance to American dominance, and some will say today resistance to Brazil. And there's a lot of resistance to Brazil in contemporary South America. And the question you really need to tackle is what forms does resistance take? You can have a range of forms of resistance and a taxonomy of resistance would provide you very, with a very neat PhD thesis type table of contents if you're looking for a topic. The third element you want to pay attention to when thinking of power and power balances is stratification. And stratification has to do with the gradients of power. I remember Andres had a presentation at Oxford one day where he presented a stratification of power in South America and you want to play along those lines and you want to complement that with issues of status and standing. Very this pushes us into head level, right? Into international society type of thinking. This is what Andy Harwell is working on at the moment. He's a big book on, on hierarchy. The hierarchical society, right? Is the title. And finally, what you want to do when looking at power, and power balances is look at capitalism and class structure. It's not in the fashion today to look at capitalism and class structure from a power perspective in international relations. It used to be in the fashion in the 60s and 70s and it fell out of favor in the 80s and 90s with the liberal rise. But now that we talk about emerging countries and Primo is very much premised on this assumption that we are moving towards a multipolar world, what makes the world multipolar is precisely changes in global capitalism and how global capitalism allocates economic power across the globe, and how transformations in class structure change the very nature of countries. The reason why the emerging countries are emerging is not so much because they are now becoming far more powerful internationally in terms of troops and bombers. It's because they are undergoing these dramatic domestic class structure change. Of course, the best illustration of all is China, and the best book on this just came out, Evan Osnos, The Age of Ambition. So he looks at how the transformation of class structure inside China is changing not only the economic outlook of the Chinese people, but their moral and religious outlook as well. But one could play with other emerging Part of the reason why Erdogan can afford to do what he does in Turkey is because he's presided over the single largest transformation in class structure in contemporary Turkey. And the reason why President Lula left power after eight years, in spite of numerous corruption scandals, with 80% approval rates, and it may well be the case that he comes back in 2018 and he was able to make his successor in spite of corruption scandals, in spite of the slowing economy, is because he presided over the single largest transformation in class structure in contemporary Brazil. And if we want to understand how power in the region evolves, that's at the heart of our analysis. The 1974 piece by a Brazilian diplomat saying Argentina can no longer organize an anti-hegemonic coalition in South America said the core reason is not that Argentina is doing lots of stupid things internationally. The core reason is that inequality in Argentina is going up 
and Argentina is killing its own middle class. Contrary to us in Brazil, which are starting from a very low base, beginning to expand a middle class. It's class analysis, it's Marx. So in many respects, the emergence of the developing countries, the new multipolar world, by necessity pushes back to Marx and Marxist analysis, which was so out of favor in the 80s and 90s. But done properly, Marx as a theoretician of power, far more than Marx in the Marxist version of Latin America in the 80s and 90s, which is a different story I won't talk about. Let me move on because time is going to be fast. The second box, the second set of things I always want to look at when looking at regions is institutions and institution building. And for the case of South America, I'm not going to say much because we have here the expert extraordinaire, the best writing on, on the institution building of South America in the last couple of years has been Andres by far. Um, the core question coming from Europe is, of course, the one that ends up being applied elsewhere. And this is the question Andy Harrell asked about South America. 20 years ago. In 1994, Andy wrote a piece called South America, a security community question mark, 1994. And the big question he had at the time was, is this region becoming a security community like Europe? This is the question Anita Bachari asked of Asia 20 years ago. Are we going now? Back in the day, Andy's answer was, for South America, no. But within South America, there's this smaller group called the Southern Cone, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, <coughs> that are beginning to show that perhaps, possibly, maybe, this could one day be. And he calls it a very loosely neat security community. So when asking questions about the institutional outlook of a region, the construction of the region and the invention of the region, I think the first cut of the cake we want to have is always, is this moving towards a security community? Because I've spoken so much on my first box, I'm going to jump lots of stuff on South America. We can play with it later. And we can have Andres help us. The second question within the institutional side of the story is what role for hegemony in institutions, in regional institutions. Uh, and the reference here for South America is Sean Burgess from the Australian National University with his book called, I won't remember the exact title, but it's Consensual Hegemony. That's the, that's the concept. So you want to ask, in a region, what room for hegemony in the building of as a human community. And the question, and this is what Andres' work has been focusing on lately, the key question for the case of South America is, are we seeing a region that is developing its own hegemonic tools to ensure a security community? And the answer is a resounding no. Because the one country that could play that role in the region, which is Brazil, doesn't. And it doesn't, on the two accounts of our regional power. Regional powers always do the same, right? They pay the cost of collective action. They punish countries that won't follow the rules of the game. And they create positive incentives to attract reluctant partners to do what it takes. That's the role of regional hegemons in any region in the building up of security communities. And Brazil does none of that for various reasons we can discuss later. But what role for hegemony is of the order? This is the question The Economist magazine has been asking about Germany in the last 10 issues. Can Germany play regional hegemon? And playing regional hegemon means always you will have to kick the Greeks a bit to make them fall into line and at the same time, you have to create the inducement, the positive incentives 
for the Greek people to be locked in, for the Greek people not to vote for someone that will promise getting out of the equation. That's not always easy, as Angela is now finding. But those are the terms of the discussion. The third issue, when we look at the institutional side of region building and region invention, is of course identity and identity development. When we look at South America, how do we answer the question, is there a South American identity? And the answer is a very clear no. There's no element to suggest that this is a region that identifies itself as such. In fact, the very meaning of the region is very highly contested. Some people use South America, some people use Latin America. The very definition of what South America might be is contested. When Simon Bolivar in the 19th century spoke of South America, he explicitly left Brazil out because it was Portuguese speaking and it was a monarchy in a setting that was supposed to be Spanish speaking and Republican. When President Lula took office, his foreign minister, Celso Morini, <coughs> gave his first speech. And in his first speech, he says, we want to engage with our South American neighbors, our Latin American neighbors, and Mexico. Kicking Mexico out of both regional formations to the sheer horror of Mexican diplomacy, of course. And the trick here is that countries will often use notions of the region for instrumental purposes. They will use the language of a shared identity for things that have nothing to do with identity, that have to do with power calculations. So in the mid-1990s, the finance minister in Brazil wrote this memo to the then president Cardoso saying, Mr. President, we are seen internationally as Latin America, and this is raising the premium of our debt. Because Latin America has such a bad name in global financial markets, whenever we are seen as Latin America, we end up paying more to, loan mo to get money to roll out our debt. Can we start detaching ourselves from Latin America? Certainly detaching ourselves from Mexico. And the president forwarded that to the foreign ministry, and it was that that led the foreign ministry for the first time to explore the notion of South America. It was a calculation about how to roll out debt from the finance minister. It had nothing to do with social interdependence in South America, which is minimal. The ignorance in South America, of South America, is phenomenal. My students, when they go clubbing, they will listen to Shakira, Colombian Shakira. But if you go to a club in Rio tonight, you will listen to, I mean, you will have Beyonce and Shakira, that's it. But the Shakira you will listen to is not black hair, slightly chubby, lovely Colombian Shakira. Is Miami-based, blonde, singing in English Shakira. To have enmeshment, to have young Brazilians listen and dance to Colombian Shakira, you have to turn Shakira into something else that is not Colombian, that sings in English. Levels of Spanish speaking training in Brazil are minuscule, travel is minuscule, even after 20 years of a big push for regional integration. So you want to distinguish between the identity bit and the instrumental bit. And the case of South America is so blatantly obvious because there's so little identity to it. Far trickier is applying that to Europe. But you want to do it as well. Because it's not at all obvious that identities can change within a generation. And if there's anything that is so striking for an outsider like me, of the response to Shafirin in Europe is the degree to which the European identity comes 
under strain when you look at the responses. But also the degree to which the European identity can be a fundamental basis upon which to build a response. The point being that rather than take identity for granted, you want to be able to conceptually put it aside, sit next to instrumental calculations, and then look at the two as distance from the thing itself as you can. Because the way officials talk about identity is always so misleading. <coughs> Let me move on to the third bit, which is governance. And the question is, how does the actual governing of the region operate? And when looking at governance, we want to move away from a state-centric world. We don't want to ask the question, can the regional hegemon provide public goods? We want to ask a very different set of questions. We want to play uh, Moises Naim, right? Moises Naim's new book is called The End of Power. And I think the subtitle is Why the People Who Were in Charge No Longer Rule Anything, or something like that. It's about the decay of power in the hands of states. And global governance is always, conceptually, the difficult connection between states and non-state actors providing governance of spaces. And here, of course, the obvious global governance types of themes are human rights and poverty alleviation and climate change and the internet and global health. And in trying to make sense of how these things are governing regions, you are forced to move away from states and look at how troublesome the relationship between states is with private sector and private providers. And there's been an awful lot of conceptual innovation in this field there's a new piece in the International Political Economy Review that is first class by Sean Storrs from um, York University in Canada, where he basically challenges the notion that we have a multipolar world in the making. He says, most people who argue that we are moving towards multipolarism say this is the case because the share of American power in the global capitalist economy is clearly declining. Global economic power is so clearly moving towards the east and the south that evidently this is an increasingly multipolar war. But then he does a trick. He opens the black box, the black box of the key private companies in the BRIC countries to look at ownership. Who owns these companies. And when he opens the black box, suddenly you find out that not only the chief owners of the major private companies and indeed state companies in the emerging world are US citizens, but he finds that after the 2008 global crisis, the proportion of US ownership has gone up, not down. That's a beautiful way of looking at global governance. If we want to understand contemporary South America, we need to do that. And no one's ever done that. If there's anybody looking for a PhD topic, this is it, guys. No one has spent the time to look at how ownership of chief companies in South America has changed. No one has looked at how the Brazilian National Development Bank, which dishes out $90 billion every year, more than the World Bank, I mean 40% more than the World Bank, has facilitated purchases by Brazilian citizens of assets in South America. If we then find that the single largest bank in Argentina is Brazilian, the single largest construction company in Argentina is Brazilian, the single largest supermarket chain and beer producer belong to Brazilian citizens, then if you want to understand what the heck is going on in the region, you do not want to get stuck in questions about state hegemony. You don't want to look, spend all your time looking at the archives in the foreign ministry because you're missing the point. There's a whole different story going on. 
If you want to understand regional order in Latin America, you want to look at how the DEA, the agency inside the American state regulating drugs and food, set the parameters for what trade you can have in Latin America. And how pharmaceutical companies, in the process of following the rules of this agency that is not run by the American state, is run by a coalition of state plus private companies, set up the rules of engagement that are crucial in trying to get things moving in terms of regional trade. So when we move away from the world of parabolics on the one hand, and the move of institutions and formal institutions on the other hand, and we end up with governance, we want to bring in the private sector and indeed organize civil society on board in a big way. Because if you don't do that, you don't get what's going on. The hottest topic now in that part of the world is of course, and indeed in this, is internet governance and how you regulate the internet. And of course, this Snowden scandal only prompts this to the top of the agenda. So interestingly, the Carnegie Endowment um, of International Peace, the Carnegie Corporation of New York and Hewlett Foundation, this year have closed down their nuclear operations. They no longer fund work on nuclear power, and they've shifted all of their portfolio to cybersecurity and internet governance. And if you want to operate in that world, then using a framework that is global governance-like, that does what Andy Harrell did the other day here, rather than power balances and institutions, is what you want to do as you organize your dissertation. Uh, adding to that, of course, is the issue of the public square. And the issue of the public square and the and social protest in general prompt up the agenda of global governance in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. But more to the point, in the aftermath of Zuccotipar and the aftermath of protests across the emerging countries. And this is one of the things that we so tend to forget about the logic of emerging countries. We're so stuck in the old ways of geopolitical thinking, looking at emerging countries as these states that have lots of trouble at home, but use their international rights to redress these issues, to get their states organized and be able to act internationally, that we often tend to forget the core lesson of political science in the 1950s and 60s, which is how much instability is a product of modernization. If you have very fast developing economies, if you have fast modernizing societies with lots of class structure change, as you have in all the big emerging countries now, that breeds a certain kind of instability because the old ways of doing things no longer suffice. One way of looking at it is, of course, protest. And you may look at protest, this would be a lovely, a lovely thesis, actually. Looking at protest in big emerging countries and the degree to which that protest limits the ability of leaders to actually do foreign policy stuff, to actually climb up the international ladder. And one could look at Mexico, or protest in Brazil, or protest indeed in Turkey, or in Indonesia, or in India, or indeed in China, across the board for big emerging countries. The public square issue is critical, as it is critical now for Europe, and as it is critical now for the United States. The last bit of very serious academic research on this in IR was done by this guy called Jeremy Suri. His book is called Power and Protest. And it's a beautiful take on the Dante. His argument basically says, the reason why Nixon and Kissinger had to come together with Khrushchev and then with Mao is only partly explained by geopolitical calculations. Don't focus too much on that side of the story. There's a far more interesting side of the story. And that's the fact that starting in 1966, you begin to have social protests big time in American country. You start with Berkeley, move on to Chicago, New York. You have shootings. The American police shoot students for the first time. 
and that spreads like wildfire. Going to London and Berlin, going to Prague and going to Paris in 68, but also, powerfully, going to China with the Cultural Revolution, going to Iran under the Shah. And he stops there. We could go further. We could say the Cordobazo in Argentina and that the local in Mexico, and indeed the first protest against the apartheid in Cape Town, and the taking of Mandela to prison. So all of that period is combusted, and as a response to the combustion, Jeremy Suri argues, you have a change in geopolitical mindsets, and Nixon moves closer to Khrushchev. And indeed, when you look at the Kissinger telecoms, a good deal of what Nixon is talking to Khrushchev about, and to Mao, is how to manage protest. That which one can do historically, because now it's 50 years on and we can look back, should not be forgotten when we look at global order now. If you look at the big books on global order, and I just did, the table of contents, not one mentions the public square. And it seems to me that it's so hard to try to grapple with the issues of, global, of regional governance without paying an awful lot of attention to that side of the story. I've completely exceeded my time, so I will go very quickly through the last bit, right? Which is normative theory. So I spoke about power, I spoke about institutions, I spoke about global govern uh, regional governance, and I want to say just two things about normative theory. The big question for normative theory is, of course, what does all of this mean to justice? Do regions, the construction of the regions, as Andres put it in the first memo, or the invention of the regions, as he put it in the second memo, does the construction and invention of regions matter for issues of justice? And the question, in some places, is a resounding yes. And I think if you read Mark Mazower's beautiful history of Europe in the second half of the 20th century, I think it's called Europe Dark Continent, then unquestionably the answer is yes. That's the big question you want to, you want to ask. Looking at it from the part of the world I pay attention to, which is South America, there are two things, or three rather. The first one is the instrumental issues <coughs> that governing elites will make of notions of regional dumb for claims of global justice. The notion that is so ingrained in the people that set up Mercosur first and UNASUR then, and in particular in the last few years when the region moved towards the left, is the notion that the region is key if you want to redress global injustices. Why? Because global justice from the standpoint of all big developing countries cannot be defined as justice as equality, but justice as redistribution. Big divide between North and South. Listen to Angela Merkel talking about justice now and her arguments about the inherent injustice of misbehavior fiscally. <coughs> And what she's saying is that if we want to understand justice in the world, justice needs to be conceived as justice as equality. All states following the same rules. Those that do not are undermining the collective project. Very different story from what you get in developing countries, in G77 kind of talk. When these countries are saying the very opposite, they are saying, that's nonsense. Because historically the international system is so unequal and hierarchical that the only responsible way to talk about justice is justice as redistribution. So yes, of course Germany needs to pay the largest chunk of the cost to redress a historical injustice. That tension is very much the order of the day. Uh, we, will, we will hear all about climate change from, from Eduardo in a bit, but that tension is at the core of normative theory. And I think it's one of the big questions we want to ask when we try to make sense of regions. And in the case of South America, at least rhetorically, the notion that UNASUR and MERCOSUR should work as shields to protect these countries from a nasty global capitalist economy 
that will ensconce them in the third world, that will prevent them from rising and thereby someday redistributing and improving the lot of the people, is ideologically so marked in the way they think about the world. So that's the first model. The second slot is to do with justice within the region. And again, lots of instrumental use of the use of the language of justice. Brazilians hate that kind of talk because of course South America is so fundamentally unequal. Right? Brazil accounts for more than half the territory, the population and the wealth of its region. So inequality in South America in the region is bigger than it is in Europe. And it's bigger than it is in the surrounding Asian area of China. Or than it is in the, indeed in the Middle East. Only North America has a similar inequality within. And an awful lot of the instrumental use that countries make of the language of justice, especially smaller countries, has to do with that. The unending complaint of Brazil's neighbors that Brazil behaves unjustly by not pulling sovereignty, by not agreeing to tie itself up to regional institutions that are actually binding, that will allow South America to redress its fundamental structural inequality. And the complaint, I think the best synthesis for it is again Andres, Andres's recent work. <coughs> And finally, there is a third element of the use, the, the language of justice in regions, that is to do with the region as a tool to redress domestic inequality. And it's the notion that it's most evident in Europe, far less evident in Latin South America, very poorly dug in South America, that regional institutions and integration have as a core purpose the notion that they might work as tools to redress fundamental inequalities and obstacles. Of course, this is not applied across the board. When President Obama talks about inequality, as in we saw in the last uh, State of the Union, no reference at all to the notion that regional schemes, irrespective of how you conceive of a region, are at the heart of it. If you look at the way David Cameron talks about inequality, or the way Holland talks about inequality, not at all obvious what the connection there might be. But because it was originally, and because it was originally in other parts, and South America being the case in point, I think that's one of the, it's the kind of question you want to answer. So what I'm trying to do is, tell you how is it that I try to think about regions whenever I encounter them, both in terms of the construction of the region and the invention of the region. You want to apply some of the tools in the kit for power analysis and power balances. You want to use the kit of institutions and institution building. You want to play with governance and all of the theoretical work coming out of the governing schools that are so popular these days, that are so in the fashion these days, but at that them, and the public square I think is the core thing one needs to bring in. And then you do want to play a little bit with normative theory around the issues of justice and how authorities in countries use the language of justice to justify or denigrate the role of regions. And I will end it there.
the business groups interact in terms of investment in these countries rather than Mercosur? Can, do you know okay. how, if there's a possibility in terms of the role of private sector for integration, regional integration? versus countries on the Pacific 
uh, sure, that are far more interested in getting hooked into the big trade agreement that America is trying to negotiate on the Pacific Rim. That's one side of the story. And it's the side of the story that gets lots of attention in the press, that gets lots of people angry inside these countries, and that informs the party political debate inside these countries. But there's a different set of issues here that have to do with what's happened in the private sector in South America. And I wouldn't say for a minute that the private sector in Mercosur has failed. But we need to understand what actually happened. Back in 1994, The Economist magazine published a special in Mercosur, and as The Economist does, it played with it. It didn't call it Mercosur, it called it Mercosur. The argument being that Mercosur was a set of rules devised by Brazil to regionalize its publicly funded private sector. The notion that what the Brazilians were trying to do was buy cheap stock across the region and be able to publicly finance big infrastructure projects tying up Brazil with its neighbors with Brazilian funding. So starting in the 90s, you have an expansion of the Bank of Brazil's presence in the rest of South America, and you have indeed the National Development Bank in Brazil beginning to explore ways of le loaning money to neighbors. In 2003, the bylaws of the National Development Bank changed to allow for this. And then you had a remarkable expansion. And in, during five years in the 2000s, Brazil was investor number one in six South American countries, pushing Spain and Portugal, and indeed the United States, to other positions. So, is this successful economically? I don't know the answer to that. But what I can tell you is that there has been a process of regionalization of the Brazilian economy that was prompted and bumped by public funding from Brazil. Another example is, of course, Venezuela. Venezuela used to be dependent for its uh, manufacturing produce from Colombia. And when Chavez comes to power, the relationship is so fraught that you actually have a diversion of trade that benefits Brazil. And Brazilian companies set up shop in Venezuela. <coughs> These had all sorts of impact. On the one hand, you had the Federation of Industries of Brazil, the private sector, pushing the Brazilian administration to actually bring Venezuela into Mercosur. Brazilian private sector pushing Venezuela to come in, because if you manage to bring it in, you would expand the trade. But on the other hand, a very different story, lots of dependence and exposure to Venezuela. If Venezuela were to default today, which is very plausible, with the barrel of oil where it is, if Venezuela were to default, the country that would suffer the brunt of it most would be Brazil. One Brazilian company, Odebrecht, big infrastructure building company, has loans of the order of $20 billion there. If Venezuela stops paying its dues to Brazil, the National Development Bank in Brazil will suffer a lot. And it might inspire others as well. So now Brazil is tied up. And the reason why it's tied up is because the private sector there has evolved in the last 15 years in ways that are very, very remarkable. The same applies to Bolivia, the same applies to Argentina from the Brazilian sector standpoint. That said, I mentioned the star, uh, the um, Sean Starr's uh, uh, article on whether there has been a globalization of capital, whether we have seen an increasingly multilateral world um, when we look at the big private companies in emerging countries, and the answer is no. No one has done that work for South America. So that's, if you don't have a topic for your PhD, this is it. Look at ownership of private, big private companies in South America. Only by doing that will we know what exactly has been the logic. I don't think the core motor for this was Mercosur, but certainly it's helped produce a mesh, economic enmeshment in ways that that enmeshment did not exist before.
That was a very long answer, sorry. Uh, the role of Mexico in the region. I know very little about Mexican foreign policy. Uh, but what I can tell you is what the Brazilian end of the operation has been. And the Brazilian end of the operation has been very hostile to Mexico. Uh, because the chief understanding in Brazilian policy and its circles is that come the end of the Cold War, Mexico relinquished any ambition to have an independent, autonomous foreign policy. Whereas Mexico had been one of the chief leaders of the G77 and indeed one of the chief operators of a South American, a Latin American space, that had been gone. That's the official argument. There's more to the argument than that. Brazilian policy elites had been reluctant to engage with Mexico way before the end of the Cold War. Remember, when we had the big foreign debt crisis in the early 80s, the Mexicans tell the Brazilians, let's get together and negotiate with the IMF and the US Treasury together. And the Brazilians say no. And they end up having very different sets of negotiations to bankroll the debt. The way Mexico and Brazil find out of the debt crisis is very different. It's not coordinated. And it's not coordinated <coughs> because the Brazilians do not want to do it together. When we move into the early 2000s, when President Cardoso gets, I told you the story, 1994, the finance minister says, the Latin American label is no good, let's build up South America as a region, and they begin to do it, and they begin to organize government to change the Latin American label for the South American label. The understanding is that one of the things that makes South America distinctive is that in this part of the world, those countries that chose to follow Mexico after the end of the Cold War, that embraced the United States and free trade with the United States, paid a high cost. This is the post-men in Argentina. This is the post Perez Venezuela. So we do not want to do with Mexico, and Mexico is different. And that's why it tells someone in his first speech, as far as minister, says, I want integration with South America, Latin America, and Mexico. He even goes as far as taking Mexico out of Latin America, rhetorically, right? The relationship between Brazil and Mexico is non-existent or very awful. Uh, Mexico has been one of the chief opponents to the notion that Brazil should have a seat in a UN Reform Security Council. And of course, Argentina and Mexico have done an awful lot together within the Security Council to develop the argument that if the Security Council were to be reformed, Latin America should have a seat that is rotating between the three. Um, of course, to the, to the horror of the, of the uh, Brazilians. As to Mexican foreign policy now, I think the big opportunity is, of course, uh, the collapse of Venezuela, right? The collapse of Venezuela is leading very fast to a changing mindset inside Cuba. Cuba no longer can be bankrolled by Venezuela. This is only prompting Cuba to move faster now that Obama has opened the doors for some kind of agreement. Could Mexico play a role there? Of course, I mean, historically, that's what organized Mexico's policy towards Latin America, right? Since 1959. <coughs> Mexico was the bridge for Cuba with the rest of the hemisphere for so much of the 60s and 70s. It organized Mexico's outlook in the world. It organized Mexico's behavior in the OAS, for instance. But again, I'm very ignorant, so I wouldn't go farther than that. On regions and the breaks, um, your question was premised on this notion that you said um, that the BRICs are more interested in global trade than they are in regional trade. And that is... <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Okay, um, when we speak about, uh, we speak about regions and regional integration, and we often put the BRICs in there without like... I have more of the tension that there's not a uh, uh, focus on or, or movement through the regions, but it's, uh, it's a yeah, multi-level order. In this multi-level order, we still we have the region, we have the regional integration, and especially through small states who are building alliances against the big ones, 
but if we speak about the big ones, we often forget that the big ones are not only the Norwegian, but the big ones are very interested, not more, but a lot in the global. Okay, let me try to answer this way. There is an assumption in so much of our literature, which I think is misplaced. It's the assumption that if you want to be a big global power, you first need to be a regional power. That global power machine requires regional power machine. That you cannot aspire to be a big global operator if you're not before that a big regional one. That's the <coughs> assumption. And an awful lot of the talk about the Brits is premised on the assumption that they are regional powers. But that's not what the evidence suggests. On two accounts. Let's look at it first historically. When Great Britain was ruling the waves, when Great Britain was a global empire, it was not a regional power in Europe. Britain did not have station troops in Europe, and it, it did not have to do the dirty business of regional powers. It did not have to secure the balance in continental Europe. Britain could afford to be a global power and rule the waves precisely because it didn't have to pay an awful lot of attention to its own region. When Britain was forced to pay attention to its own region, first in the First World War and then in the Second World War, and play balance of power with logics with Germany, it ceased to be a global power. So that's one instance, historically, where that connection evidently is not obvious. But let's move on. The answer to the question, is Brazil a regional power, is no. This is what Andres' work shows. This is his big contribution. No. Can you be a Brit and not be a regional power? Yes, you can. Will that, have pro will that create problems? Of course it will create problems. I mean, look at the state of South America now. It's an absolute mess. And that mess has a great deal to do with the successive mistakes of Brazil in that region, right? Will Brazil be able to sustain the notion that it's a global power without being a regional one? I don't know. But then, and I want to go back to the question in the back, we normally think about these things from a geopolitical perspective. When we really want to bring Marx in and do a geoeconomic story, because the reason why we're moving towards a world that is different from the post-1945 world is not only to do with the stuff of geopolitics. It's to do with the stuff of geoeconomics. It's to do with the fact that global capitalism has indeed changed. And the global production chains have changed location. It's to do with the fact that you could have a Brazil that is a diplomatic pygmy in South America, that cannot operate South America, that doesn't understand South America, that makes an awful lot of cock-ups in South America, and yet have a Brazilian private sector that is not only owning ever more stock in South America, but also it's far more exposed to South America and frail to South America. And if neighbors in South America were to collapse, they would drag down the Brazilian economy with them. And Brazil could make all, all the mistakes that countries do. Not understand what's going on, not come up with tools to prevent collapsing neighboring countries from affecting its economy. So there are these two things. There's the geopolitics side of the story, and this is the geoeconomic side of the story. And we, in IR, haven't done enough with the geoeconomic side of the story. And the reason why, whenever IR people go speak in conferences of economists, we are the laughing stock. Because they look at us slightly pitifully. Bless them, they don't get what the heck is going on. So we want to bring that in to some degree. And that's why international political economy is so absolutely crucial in any, in any IR training. Okay. We have some time. Anyone? Thank you, Matthias, for uh, this excellent uh, take on uh, the issues that we're trying to address in Grimo. There's a little danger in what you said because our students all have their topics. <laughs> And sometimes they relate to what you suggested as the key little things to study, and sometimes they don't. So I hope that 
we didn't sort of convince every one of them to now start with something new. So that's, uh, <laughs> Please don't follow me. The result is late, so you don't want to do that. That's for sure. Let me just follow up with, with three questions to three of the areas you touched upon. The first one being about these um, global governance issues and the geoeconomic side, as you mentioned. You said that it's important, uh, citing the Sean Starr's piece in uh, IPR, you said that it's not just the private companies that you should look into, but also the state companies. And, and let me just get this right. I mean, you just say yes or no, you explain on it. Uh, it's critical whether these companies are listed, whether they are going public, and whether there's capital mobility. Because that's the same in Germany. I mean, if you take a look at who owns the big German companies, and it's a minuscule amount that is owned by Germans, and the rest is international. Of course, it's, it's American and it's British. Uh, Funds they collect money and invest heavily in these companies. So, so much if you study German politics, you, you should also be aware of the fact that they are not there. Some family, there's some, some family ownership. The big rest of these companies is driven by, and I assume that's the case in the rest of the world as well. As soon as you get access to these funds, simply because we talk billions of pension funds and whatever circles around, they go to all these places and pick the right companies and they tend to do the they tend to know who's going to be successful. So state companies, only when they are publicly listed, and there are several state companies in these, these countries that are not publicly listed. So those ones is where you sort of play out uh, national interests, if you like, the state interests and uh, these company behavior should be more or less in line, or more in line than in the cases where they are publicly listed. So I want you to explore and sort of comment on this one. The other one that I find very interesting is the identity importance that's attributed to the notion of identity. And of course, I'm not an expert on, on Latin America or in South America, but I can take it from the European point of view and from the African point of view, maybe. Uh, the European point of view, I find that there is not really at all any European identity. It's far more based on national issues. There's an attempt, as we learned yesterday, to construct some sort of collective European memory, Holocaust, and human rights, and whatnot. But it doesn't really play out in terms of crisis when you look at the current situation. And we have the rise of the right simply because it's all focused on national identity. It's not asking the international or the, the regional questions. This is a business of intellectuals and of academics. But it's not really when you sort of burn it down to where the vote goes and where, the, where people go to the streets. So identity is very, very tricky. Even in the European case, I, I totally subscribe to what you said. It's going to take generations to build up something that is that maybe on top of your local identity and your national identity, there is a European you know, that would be the best thing to achieve over generations. But not that you're totally based on the European identity. That's just rubbish uh, to my take. And why should that then be the case in other parts of the world where regional attempts of regional integration are much less uh, supranational, <coughs> sharing of power and what have you? I mean, they're, they're all intergovernmental, or most of them are intergovernmental. So how can you expect a regional identity to develop? And the third point I wanted to to ask you, it's not really, um, uh, it's not that I disagree with what you said, but you mentioned in this issue of trends, the justice question essentially, that what is most important for many uh, parts of these regional setups, they consider themselves more of developing countries, the G77 line, uh, is to say we're interested in redistribution. And my argument would be to say yes, that's true. All of them are interested in respect, first and foremost. I mean, this is no longer the colonial days. Uh, you just want to be treated equal. Sovereignty is the key thing, no matter how important you are and how much resources you have. So respect is more important maybe than redistribution. And redistribution really depends on the policy. I find that, for example, when you look at, we're going to talk about it, about these environmental matters, there's no interest in redistribution. Uh, many of the developing countries love uh, uh, Rio 1992 set up, whereby the burden is to be carried by the Developed countries, and we, the developing countries, we are allowed to go on because there's this historical thing, etc. So there is an element of redistribution, but it depends on the policy area. That's totally different when it's not one dollar, one vote, or one country, one vote, as in the international environmental policies, where it's one dollar, one vote. You want to have more, of say, in the IMF and in the World Bank, and you can get it instead of your own institutions, simply because you're not sort of moving forward with your own reform agenda. So redistribution depends on the policy field and on the if you like decision making setup that exists in these various policy fields. So that's maybe a, an additional qualification, but I expect you would also agree that it depends on a much closer look at the various fields before you reach general conclusions on what it's all about. Yes, you can answer these three. 
I, I promise I'll be, I'll be very quick. On the issue of geoeconomics, um, your question is, surely when we're looking at the big developing countries for sure, but overall, if we want to understand ownership, then we can only look at publicly listed companies. And indeed, what Sean Storrs has done is he's looked at the publicly listed companies uh, for the BRICS, and he's found that ownership of those companies is disproportionately held by US citizens across the board, and pensions fund play a key role in that story. But there's more than that. This has all sorts of impact, right? So now Brazil, Brazil's biggest company, the oil company, is mired in a ma massive corruption scandal, and the Brazilian law is moving in one track, but there is another track that's moving even faster, far more interesting, which is the courts in the United States, simply because ownership of the company is not only Brazilian. So that's one side. What about companies that are not publicly listed? There is an element there as well because they need leverage to invest. So in all the big emerging economies, and in particular China, you have loads of companies that are not publicly listed, that are state owned, that in theory you would think, well, that's the national, that's national power. If we were to look at distributions of power in a very 1970s way. But what that means is, is the fact that the leverage they need to invest necessarily goes abroad. They are exposed in foreign currency. And the, those who dominate that currency... So all of this is to say that there was a moment in IR where, certainly when I was a, a graduate student, when there was this notion that hegemonic theories liberal hegemonic theories were on the down. I remember the disencouragement to apply the kind of Kiohenesque, the Gilpinesque approaches to global economic power. And it seems to me that we've now come full circle. Now that the issue of the emerging countries is back on the fore, there's an element of that that you want to do. Uh, there is new work being done uh, in IP that is applied to this. And what's his name? Wonderful guy based in California, now at American University, senior IP scholar. To the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Just bringing in the question. Yeah, he's moved from Stanford to, or was it, San Diego to American University. It'll come. He's publishing a book now on the global economic, I think the title is The International Political Economy of the BRICS and looks precisely at, at this topic and the book is about to come up and I can't, it'll come. But that, that I think is the, uh, the reference. On identity, I agree with you entirely, that was my, my point, very thin as, as a way of understanding regional constructions and regional inventions to stick to our topic, but, and this is a big but, we have that identity stuff can only take you so far in understanding regions. And all my point was nothing there in South America to suggest there is a South American identity in the making, on the contrary. But that doesn't mean we should throw away the identity story. And it shouldn't mean we needn't worry about things when we study world politics because the fact, as you mentioned, the fact that national identity is so much part of the game, that brings identity back in, right? It's national, it's not regional, but it's identity nonetheless. And more than that, the rise of religious identity as a major force in international politics is very far from trivial. The ability to organize the world according to visions of transnational religious identity <coughs> is absolutely the order of the day, with the rise of Al-Qaeda for sure. Ali Abrahimi, I think, has the best book on this. Ali Abrahimi, the book, I won't remember the title of the book, but Ali Abrahimi has this book with Oxford University Press, where what she does basically is take the text of Al-Qaeda and all of the speeches by Bin Laden and study them as political theory. 
Where does it come from? And of course, this pushes you into solidarity's understanding of international relations, transnational identity. Phenomenal book in the sense that it rescues the notion of identity from the very narrow and not very productive constraints of regional studies. So, absolutely agree with you, but identity is very much there as a force in world politics in 2015, I think. Uh, and the recent events in Europe only, only uh, attest to that. On the issue of justice, of course, I agree with you entirely. Redistribution and goals for redistribution will vary across policy area. And you know, someone doing norm a normative theory thesis could very well organize the structure of the thesis by saying, I want to understand what justice is about in the 21st century, and I'm going to have seven case studies on different policy areas, the environment, global health, internet governance, what have you. No doubts about that. But let me try and push the envelope a little bit further. The first rising global order of a challenge to the West organized around nation states comes from the 60s and 70s, right? In the era of decolonization, you begin to have these groups that begin to claim that there is a fundamental historical injustice that needs to be redressed. And this is formalized as such, as a multilateral attempt. And I think the big reference for this is Hedley Bull's Hagley Lectures of 1984, uh, the title of which is The Challenge to the West. So what is the challenge to the West? The challenge to the West is the notion that so much of the post-colonial world will now unite in demands for redressing. And all of that which was um, seen in the G77, in the call for a new economic global order in the United Nations in the 70s that organized so much of the big regimes that were being born at the time, disappeared in the 1990s, right? The 90, I think it's Ronald Reagan who said, the age of the third world is gone. And there was an awful lot of that, <coughs> right? Um, <coughs> the new book just came out on this, which is fascinating is Daniel Sargent's The Shock of the New. The Shock of the New. So it's a global history of the 1970s. And he shows how in the 1970s you begin to move away from that world, that post-decolonization world, into the world of Reagan, Thatcher, but also the liberal experiment in Chile under Pinochet and the experiment of <coughs> economic reform in China under Deng Xiaoping and how that brings the third world to an end, as it were, throughout the 90s. But then, interestingly, in the 2000s and the 2010, and this is the story of the Lulas and the Erdogans and the China of that period, the Manmohan Singh, you can perfectly have economies in the developing world that begin to open up and embrace so many of the values of, call it, neoliberal reform whilst at the same time securing the old agenda of the 1970s, redressed as something new, but not really that new. I was talking to a Brazilian diplomat the other day, um, and you know, the, Brazil, the Brazilian foreign ministry is, is relatively small, no ability to do planning or conduct studies, so oftentimes they're operating in the dark. They go to a meeting and they don't quite know what the national interest should be because there aren't any studies to support it. And they say, very openly, that when in doubt, go to the G77. Why? I ask. Because the G77 position so oftentimes run counter the interest of Brazil's <coughs> poorest people. And the answer is, first of all, we know how to do it. We've been doing it 50 years now. And secondly, it's one area where we have some voice. In other areas, you know, the big players won't let us speak, so and we have nothing to contribute anyway. That notion, cynical as it sounds, helps explain part of the story. But there's another part of the story. Look at the case of China. 
Chinese leaders have not relinquished their identity as a developing country, as a third world country. On the contrary, Chinese leaders want to play big and play with America and the world of the G2, but not for a minute are they saying we're no longer a third world country. On the contrary. And the reason why the Chinese are so interested in the BRICS is not to do with global trade, because they don't need the BRICS for global trade. And it's not to do with investing for infrastructure through the BRICS bank, because they can do that through the RAND bank. The BRICS of the Chinese is a very small, not costly operation at all. All it takes is one trip a year to show neighbors of China and to show the world that China is still a third world country. So China wants to have it both ways, like Brazil wants to have it both ways, like India has to have it wants to have it both ways. And when you scrap the surface, what you end up with in the end is the hold of the 1970s there. And it's bizarre. And yet it isn't. Look at the people who run the foreign ministries in the BRICS countries. All of them, no exception. When were they trained when they were young, as young people? <coughs> they were trained, they cut their teeth in the proceedings of the G77. That's the world they inhabit. That's the world they understand. That's the world where they feel secure. So, ironically, all this talk of emerging countries and multipolar world and the rest of it conceptually goes in one direction, but when we look at the empirics, Jesus, we're still stuck in the 70s and 80s. And I will finish with this. The 1980s become history this year. This year, for the first time, all of the secret papers in the Reagan Presidential Library are opening up. So if you want to do a global history of the 1980s and explore these subjects, to try and trace back the prehistory of the BRICS, this is the time to do it. Because we can now tell the story. Global historians have done the 50s and 60s and 70s now. Daniel Sargent, The Shock of the New, is, I think, the, by far the best book on the 70s. I won't say the definitive book on the 70s, of course, but it's remarkable. And it's now time to move on to the 80s. And archives are open, so just go do it. <coughs> I think we have time for one question. I mean, five minutes. Beatrix has here before. Sorry, she I don't know if I have a strength. Go on. Beatrix has here before. Um, I actually just wanted to have a quick comment about the European identity issue, which I, I put it into the corner of thinking that it cannot be overplayed. On the other hand, you know, because of the supernatural institution, and because there is a sense of kind of collective identity when it has to be used. I think, you know, you cannot say that people identify themselves all the time as European. And we sort of, you know, kind of take away the kind of rise of the regional and localism in, the, in national politics, even in, in, in all over Europe. But there's still a level of kind of European identity that people can actually access, and European bureaucrats do it all the time in foreign negotiations. So in some sense, I'm kind of in between the two of you, the way I see European identity. My question is really about the norms of power and rule, but you know, uh, this is in the second part of that. I, I don't understand where you're coming from and the kind of things that you mentioned, Marxism, you know, even the norms of power comes from the cosmopolitan and communitarian ideas. Um, but what I would like to understand is that obviously we apply to Europe all the time. Have you seen any application of it in South America? And if not, do you think it's actually applicable to either? Brazil sees itself as a kind of normative power in a similar way as you know we are fighting with us. Okay, so the issue of normative power, and it's fascinating for someone coming from the outside, because the notion of normative power has taken such deep roots in European IR writing that it's very difficult to historicize and critique from, from the outside because it's become the norm. It's become the way IR scholars in Europe talk about Europe's place in the world. Uh, so let me give you my take, which is very much from, from the outside. The notion of normative power has in it the idea that part of the things that allow you to get things done internationally, to manage global order, 
are to do with your ability to promote and uphold norms. And there is the understanding in Europe that is very ingrained that in the post-1945 world, where you have the Americans doing all of the nasty stuff of hardcore power, you can have the cherry on top that is normative, that is Europe, trying, first of all, to tie up the big hegemon, ensure the big hegemon doesn't do clumsy things as hegemons do, by adhering to some norms. And that there is a degree of civilization that is added to the world by the mere fact that Europe can create new norms across the field from human rights to fishing rights. And that's fundamentally structuring the way so much of European Europe are, as I said, evolves. What happens when you look at it from the outside? There are two responses. One is cynical, conjectural. The other one is conceptual. The cynical one says, how is this different from mission civilisatrice? It's the same thing. You're giving it a better name. But in the end, is you guys pushing and shoving, really. And as you apply to specific policy issues, the fundamental hypocrisy of all-time empire comes out. And what diplomats in the BRIC countries love doing these days is saying, look at the intervention in Libya. Look at Resolution 1973. All this lovely wording about preserving the lives of people, the people of Benghazi. And the Security Council is going for it and giving authority to the Security Council to intervene. And then the Security Council is telling NATO you can intervene with the text and the spirit of the law saying there will be no troops on the ground. And suddenly, there you have the French on the ground providing weapons to one side of the, of the fight. With the impact that we've seen. So if you look at the way BRIC countries are now talking about Libya, and the reason why they were so keen on supporting Assad, because we don't want to see in Syria what happened in Libya, what they're saying, which is very perverse in a way, is the reason why Libya is where it is now is because the Europeans interpreted Resolution 1973 as they did. So they come with this talk of normative power of Push comes to shove. This is what they do. Look at the French in Mali. Look at what Germany is doing in Yemen. Are we really supporting an illegal war, an undeclared war on the Yemenis through drones? All of that, all of that talk is very much how developing countries interpret cynically the notion of normative power. There's nothing normative about that. It's good old power coated in a language of rights and norms to be respected that are very easily violated because you're kind of forbidden. That's the cynical response. There is a conceptual response to that that is to do with what norms you want to uphold. And the fact of the matter is that of course the BRICS in general have an outlook that is normative. There is no power without norms, right? So by definition, every emerging power will have a take on norms that it wants to secure. But when we look at the norms, and this is the point he made just before, when we look at the norms these countries want to uphold, it's about it's to do with respect, but respect defined in a very precise way. It's respect as sovereignty. And it's this very notion that sovereignty rights are not yet equally distributed internationally that some are more sovereign than others. Whenever Brazilian academics teach in their class Andres' book, uh, articles, and Andres' question is, why on earth is Brazil not doing what regional powers do? Why won't Brazil do Germany? Putting out some degree of sovereignty to reassure neighbors, to provide some degree of leadership, to pay the cost of collective action in South America. The response you get, which is the official Brazilian response to that kind of stuff, is 
Germany can afford to concede sovereignty because it's fully sovereign. We, 500 years of the periphery, at the receiving end of a nasty capitalist system, are not fully sovereign. We've been dominated historically first by Portuguese imperialism and then British imperialism and French imperialism and Dutch imperialism in parts of Brazil and then American imperialism. So the fight for sovereignty is not ended. And that's why reading Henley Bull 1984, 30 years on in 2014, is so important. And that's why the echoes of the 70s still resonate today. So are these normative powers? Well, to a degree, listen to what the Chinese say. Listen to the debate about climate change norms. The role of sovereignty in, in the discussion of those norms is still very fundamental. But you know, there's nothing new about this, right? The fight over international politics has always been not just about territory, not just about the ability to produce economically, it's also been about norms and how we regulate what we do and how we talk about how we regulate what we do. Okay, we are out of time. We wish we could be for two hours more, I guess. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, you much. Oh, someone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you.